Section 20 of The Black Dog and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Brown. The Black Dog and Other Stories by A. E. Coppard. The Poor Man. Continued. From that time forward, Dan gave up his boozing and devoted himself to the boy, Little Martin, who, a Thasper joker suggested, might have some kinship with the notorious Betty of that name. But Dan's voice was now seldom heard singing upon the roads he traveled. They were icy, wintry roads, but that was not the cause of his muteness. It was severance from the choir. Not from its connoted spirit of religion, there was little enough of that in Dan Pavey, but from the solemn beauty of the chorale, which it was his unique gift to adorn, and in which he had shared with eagerness and pride since his boyhood. To be cast out from that was to be cast from something he held most dear, the opportunity of expression in an art which he had made triumphantly his own. With the coming of spring, he repaired one evening to a town some miles away and interviewed a choirmaster. Thereafter, Dan Pavey journeyed to and fro twice every Sunday to sing in a church that lay seven or eight miles off, and he kept it all a profound secret from Thasper until his appearance at the county musical festival, where he won the treasured prize for tenor soloists. Then Dan was himself again. To his crude apprehension, he had been vindicated, and he was heard once more caroling in the lanes of the Vale as he had been heard any time for these twenty years. The child began its schooling, but though he was free to go about the village, little Martin did not wander far. The tidy cluster of hair about his pole was of deep chestnut color. His skin, Meg said, was like alabaster. It was soft and unfreckled, always pale, his eyes were two wet damsons, so Meg declared. They were dark and ever-questioning. As for his nose, his lips, his cheeks, his chin, Meg could do no other than call it the face of a blessed saint, and indeed he had some of the bearing of a saint, so quiet, so gentle, so shy. The golden ring he no longer wore, it hung from a tin tack on the bedroom wall. Old John, who lived next door, became a friend of his. He was very aged. In the Vale you got to be a hundred before you knew where you were, and he was very bent. He resembled a sickle standing upon its handle. Very bald, too, and so very sharp. Martin was staring up at the roof of John's cottage. "'What are you looking at, my boy?' "'Chimbley,' whispered the child. "'Oh, that's crooked, ain't it?' "'Yes, crooked.' I know tis, but I can't help it. My chimney's crooked, and I can't put it straight neither. I can't put it right. My chimney's crooked, ain't it? Ah, and I'm crooked too. Yes, said Martin. I know, but I can't help it. It is crooked, ain't it? said the old man, also staring up at a red pot tilted at an angle suggestive of conviviality. Yes. That chimney's crooked, but you come along and look at my beautiful bird. A cock-thrush inhabited a cage in the old gaffer's kitchen. Martin stood before it. "'There's a beautiful bird, hoiks!' cried old John, tapping the bars of the cage with his terrible fingernail. "'But he won't sing.' "'Won't he sing?' "'He don't make himself at home. "'He don't make himself at home at all, do he, my beautiful bird? "'No, he don't. "'So I'm going to chop his head off,' said the laughing old man, "'and then I shall bile him.' Afterwards, Martin went every day to see if the thrush was still there. And it was. Martin grew. Almost before Dan was aware of it, the child had grown into a boy. At school, he excelled nobody in anything except, perhaps, behavior. But he had a strange little gift for unobtrusively not doing the things he did not care for, and these were rather many unless his father was concerned in them. Even so, the affection between them was seldom tangibly expressed. Their alliance was something far deeper than its expression. Dan talked with him as if he were a grown man, and perhaps he often regarded him as one. 
he was the only being to whom he ever opened his mind. As they sat together in the evening while Dan put in a spell at a turning chair, at which he was astoundingly adept, the father would talk to his son, or rather he would heap upon him all the unuttered thoughts that had accumulated in his mind during his adult years. The dog would lull with his head on Martin's knees. The boy would sit nodding gravely, though seldom speaking. He was an untiring listener. Like sire, like son, thought Dan, he will always coop his thoughts up within himself. It was the one characteristic of the boy that caused him anxiety. Never take pattern by me, he would adjure him. Not by me, I'm a fool, a failure, just grass. And I'm trying to instruct you, but you've no call to follow in my fashion. I'm a weak man. There's been thoughts in my mind that I daren't let out. I wanted to do things that other men don't seem to do and don't want to do. They were not evil things, and what they were I've nigh forgotten now. I never had much ambition, I wasn't clever. I wanted to live a simple life, in a simple way, the way I had a mind to. I can't remember that either. But I did not do any of those things because I had a fear of what other people might think of me. I walked in the ruck with the rest of my mates and did the things I didn't ever want to do, and now I can only wonder why I did them. I sung them the silly songs they liked and not the ones I cherished. I agreed with most everybody and all agreed with me. I'm a friendly man too friendly, and I went back on my life. I made naught of my life, you see. I just sat over the job like a snob codgering an old boot. The boy would sit regarding him as if he already understood. Perhaps that curious little mind did glean some flavor of his father's tragedy. You've no call to follow me, you'll be a scholar. Of course, I know some of those long words at school take a bit of licking together, like elephant and saucepan. You get about halfway through them and then you're done, you're mastered. I was just the same, like sire, like son, and I'm no better now. If you and me was to go to yon school together and sit on the same stool together, I warrant you would win the prize and I should wear the dunce's cap. All except sums, and there I should beat ye. You'd have all the candy and I'd have all the cane, You'd be king and I'd be the dirty rascal, so you've no call to follow me. What you want is courage and to do the things you've a mind to. I never had any and I didn't. Dan seldom kissed his son. Neither of them sought that tender expression, though Meg was forever ruffling the boy for these pledges of affection, and he was always gracious to the old woman. There was a small mole in the center of her chin, and in the center of the mole grew one short, stiff hair. It was a surprise to Martin when he first kissed her. Twice a week, father and son bathed in the shed devoted to chair. The tub was the half of a wooden barrel. Dan would roll up two or three buckets of water from the well. They would both strip to the skin. The boy would kneel in the tub and dash the water about his body for a few moments. While Martin toweled himself, Dan stepped into the tub, and after laving his face and hands and legs, he would sit down in it. Ready? Martin would ask, and scooping up the water in an iron basin, he would pour it over his father's head. Name of God, that's sharpish this morning, Dan would say. It would strip the bark off a crocodile. Bro! But there, winter and summer, I go up and down the land, and there's not ugh, a mighty difference between them. It's mostly fancy. Come day, go day, frost or fair doings, all alike I go about the land, and there's little in winter I haven't the heart to rejoice in. On with your breeches, or I'll be at the porridge pot afore you're clad. All their talk about winter and their dread of it shows poor spirit. Nothing's prettier than a fall of snow, nothing more grand than the storms upending the woods. There's no more rain in winter than in summer, you can be shod for it, and there's a heart back of your ribs that's proof against any blast. Is this my shirt or yours? Dashed if they buttons ain't the plague of my life. Country is grand year's end to year's end, whether or no. I once lived in London, only a few weeks, and for noise and for terror and for filth, name a God, there was bugs in the butter there once there was. But the boy's chosen season was that time of year when the plums ripened. Pavy's garden was then a tiny paradise. 
You put a spell on these trees, Dan would declare to his son every year when they gathered the fruit. I planted them nearly twenty years ago, two gauges and one magni bonum, but they never growed enough to make a puddin. They always bloomed well and looked well. I propped them and I dunged them, but they wouldn't beer at all and I'm a-gonna cut them down. When along comes you. Well, hadn't those trees borne remarkable ever since he'd come there? Of course, good luck's deceiving, and it's never bothered our family over much. Still, bad luck is one thing, and bad life's another. And yet, I don't know, they come to much the same in the end, there's very little difference. There's so much misunderstanding. Half the folks don't know their own good intentions, nor all the love that's sunk deep in their own minds. But nothing in the world gave or could give Dan such flattering joy as his son's sweet treble voice. Martin could sing. In the dark months no evening passed without some instruction by the proud father. The living room at the back of the shop was the tiniest of rooms, and its smallness was not lessened nor its tidiness increased by the stacks of merchandise that had strayed from Meg's emporium into every corner and overflowed every shelf in packages, piles, and bundles. The metalliferous categories, iron nails, lead pencils, tin tacks, zinc ointment, and brass hinges, were there. Platoons of bottles were there, bottles of blue-black writing fluid, bottles of scarlet, and presumably plebeian, ink, bottles of lollipops and of oil, both hair and castor, Balls of string, of blue, of peppermint, and balls to bounce were adjacent to an assortment of prim-looking books, account, memorandum, exercise, and note. But the room was cozy, and if its inhabitants fitted it almost as closely as birds fit their nests, they were as happy as birds, few of whom, save the swallows, sing in their nests. With pitch pipe to hand and a bundle of music before them, Dan and Martin would begin. The dog would snooze on the rug before the fire. Meg would snooze amply in her armchair until roused by the sudden terrific tinkling of her shop bell. She would waddle off to her dim little shop. Every step she took rattling the paraffin lamp on the table, the coal in the scuttle, and sometimes the very panes in the window, and the dog would clamber into her chair. Having supplied an aged gaffer with an ounce of caraway seed, or some gay lad with a packet of cigarettes, Meg would waddle back and sink down upon the dog, whereupon its awful indignation would sound to the very heavens, drowning the voices even of Dan and his son. "'What shall we wind up with?' Dan would ask at the close of the lesson, and as often as not Martin would say, "'You must sing Timmy.' This was Timmy, and it had a tune something like the chorus to Father O'Flynn." Oh, Timmy, my brother, best son of our mother, our labor it prospers, the mowing is done. A holiday take you, the loss it won't break you, a day's never lost if a holiday's won. We'll go with clean faces to see the horse races, and if the luck chances, we'll gather some gear. But never a jockey will win it, my cocky, who catches one glance from a girl I know there. There's lords and there's ladies with pretty sunshadies, and farmers and jossers and fat men and small. But the pride of these trips is the scallywag gypsies, with not whole rag to the backs of em all. There's coconut shying and devil defying, and a racket and babble to hear and to see. With boxing and shooting and fine highfaluting, from chaps with a table and thimble and pea. My Nancy will be there, the best thing to see there. She'll win all the praises with ne'er a rebuke. And she has a sister, I wonder you've missed her, as sweet as the daisies and fit for a duke. Come along, brother Timmy, don't linger, but give me my hat and my purse and your company there. For sporting and courting, the cream of resorting, and nothing much worse, Timmy, come to the fair. 
On the third anniversary of Martin's homecoming, Dan rose up very early in the dark morn, and leaving his son sleeping, he crept out of the house followed by his dog. They went away from Thasper, though the darkness was profound and the grass filled with dew, out upon the hills towards Chapel Cheery. The night was starless, but Dan knew every trick and turn of the paths, and after an hour's walk he met a man waiting by a signpost. They conversed for a few minutes and then went off together, the dog at their heels, until they came to a field gate. Upon this they fastened a net and then sent the dog into the darkness upon his errand, while they waited for the hare which the dog would drive into the net. They waited so long that it was clear the dog had not drawn its quarry. Dan whistled softly, but the dog did not return. Dan opened the gate and went down the fields himself, scouring the hedges for a long time, but he could not find the dog. The murk of the night had begun to lift, but the valley was filled with mist. He went back to the gate. The net had been taken down. His friend had departed. Perhaps he had been disturbed. The dog had now been missing for an hour. Dan still hung about, but neither friend nor dog came back. It grew gray and more gray, though little could be distinguished, the raw mist obscuring everything that the dawn uncovered. He shivered with gloom and dampness. His boots were now as pliable as gloves. His eyebrows had gray drops upon them, so had his mustache and the backs of his hands. His dark coat looked as if it was made of gray wool. It was tightly buttoned around his throat, and he stood with his chin crumpled, unconsciously holding his breath until it burst forth in a gasp. But he could not abandon his dog, and he roamed once more down into the misty valley towards woods that he knew well, whistling softly and with great caution a repetition of two notes. And he found his dog. It was lying on a heap of dead, sodden leaves. It just whimpered. It could not rise, it could not move, it seemed paralyzed. Dawn was now really upon them. Dan wanted to get the dog away, quickly, it was a dangerous quarter, but when he lifted it to his feet, the dog collapsed like a scarecrow. In a flash, Dan knew he was poisoned. He had probably picked up some piece of dainty flesh that a farmer had baited for the foxes. He seized a knob of chalk that lay thereby, grated some of it into his hands, and forced it down the dog's throat. Then he tied the lead to its neck. He was going to drag the dog to its feet and force it to walk. But the dog was past all energy. It was limp and mute. Dan dragged him by the neck for some yards as a man draws behind him a heavy sack. It must have weighed three stone, but Dan lifted him onto his own shoulders and staggered back up the hill. He carried it thus for half a mile, but then he was still four miles from home, and it was daylight, and any moment he might meet somebody he would not care to meet. He entered a ride opening into some coverts, and, bending down, slipped the dog over his head to rest upon the ground. He was exhausted and felt giddy. His brains were swirling around, trying to slop out of his skull, and, yes, the dog was dead, his old dog dead. When he looked up, he saw a keeper with a gun standing a few yards off. "'Good morning,' said Dan. All his weariness was suddenly gone from him. "'I'll have your name and address,' replied the keeper, a giant of a man, with a sort of contemptuous affability. "'What for?' "'You'll hear about what for,' the giant grinned. "'I'll be sure to let you know in due course.' He laid his gun upon the ground and began searching in his pockets, while Dan stood up with rage in his heart and confusion in his mind. So the old imp was at him again. Huh, said the keeper. I've lost my notebook somewheres. Have you got a bit of paper on ye? The culprit searched his pockets and produced a folded fragment. Thanks. The giant did not cease to grin. What is it? What? queried Dan. Your name and address. "'Ah, but what do you want it for? What do you think I'm doing?' protested Dan. "'I've a net in my pocket which I took from a gate about an hour ago. I saw summit was afoot, and me and a friend of mine have been looking for ye. Now let's have your name and no nonsense.' "'My name,' said Dan. "'My name, well, it is Piper.' "'Piper, is it? Ah, was you baptized ever?' 
Peter, said Dan savagely. Peter Piper. Well, you've picked a tidy peppercorn this time. Again, he was searching his pockets. There was a frown on his face. You'd better lend me a bit of pencil, too. Dan produced a stump of lead pencil, and the gamekeeper, smoothing the paper on his lifted knee, wrote down the name of Peter Piper. And where might you come from? He peered up at the miserable man who replied, From Leasington, naming a village several miles to the west of his real home. Leasington, commented the other. You must know John Eustace, then. John Eustace was a sporting farmer famed for his stock and his riches. Know him, exclaimed Dan. He's my uncle. Oh, ah. Uh. The other carefully folded the paper and put it into his breast pocket. Well, you can trot along home now, my lad. Dan knelt down and unbuckled the collar from his dead dog's neck. He was fond of his dog. It looked piteous now. And kneeling there, it suddenly came upon Dan that he had been a coward again. He had told nothing but lies, foolish lies, and he had let a great hulking flunky walk roughshod over him. In one astonishing moment, the reproving face of his little son seemed to loom up beside the dog. The blood flamed in his brain. I'll take charge of that, said the keeper, snatching the collar from his hand. Blast you! Dan sprang to his feet and suddenly screaming like a madman, I'm Dan Pavey of Thasper. He leapt at the keeper with a fury that shook even that calm stalwart. You would, would ye? he yapped, darting for his gun. Dan also seized it, and in their struggle, the gun was fired off harmlessly between them. Dan let go. My God, roared the keeper. You'd murder me, would ye? With my own gun, would ye? He struck Dan a swinging blow with the butt of it, yelling, Would ye? Would ye? Would ye? And he did not cease striking until Dan tumbled senseless and bloody across the body of the dog. Soon another keeper came hurrying through the trees. Tried to murder me with me own gun, he did, declared the big man, with me own gun. They revived the stricken pavey after a while and then conveyed him to a policeman who conveyed him to a jail. The magistrates took a grave view of the case and sent it for trial at the assizes. They were soon held, he had not long to wait, and before the end of November he was condemned. The assize court was a place of intolerable gloom, intolerable formality, intolerable pain, but the public seemed to enjoy it. The keeper swore Dan had tried to shoot him, and the prisoner contested this. He did not deny that he was the aggressor. The jury found him guilty. What had he to say? He had nothing to say, but he was deeply moved by the spectacle of the Reverend Scroop standing up and testifying to his sobriety, his honesty, his general good repute, and pleading for a lenient sentence because he was a man of considerable force of character, misguided, no doubt, a little unfortunate and prone to recklessness. Said the judge, examining the papers of the indictment, I see there was a previous conviction for betting offenses. That was three years ago, my lord. There has been nothing of the kind since, my lord, of that I am sure, quite sure. Scroop showed none of his old-time confident aspect. He was perspiring and trembling. The clerk of the assize leaned up and held a whispered colloquy with the judge, who then addressed the rector. Apparently he is still a betting agent. He gave a false name and address, which was taken down by the keeper on a piece of paper furnished by the prisoner. Here it is, on one side the name of Peter Pope Piper, sir, Piper, and on the other side this is written. 3 O.C. Race, Pretty Deer, 5 L. To Win, J. Klopstock. Are there any Klopstocks in your parish? Klopstock, murmured the parson. It is the name of my cook. What had the prisoner to say about that? The prisoner had nothing to say, and he was sentenced to twelve months' imprisonment with hard labor. So Dan was taken away. He was a tough man, an amenable man, and the mere rigors of the prison did not unduly afflict him. His behavior was good, and he looked forward to gaining the maximum remission of his sentence. Meg, his mother, went to see him once, alone, but she did not repeat the visit. The prison chaplain paid him special attention. He, too, was a scroop, 
a huge fellow, not long from Oxford, and Pavey learned that he was related to the Thasper Rector. The new year came, February came, March came, and Dan was afforded some privileges. His singing in chapel was much admired, and occasionally he was allowed to sing to the prisoners. April came, May came, and then his son Martin was drowned in a boating accident on a lake in a park. The Thasper children had been taken there for a holiday. On hearing it, Pavey sank limply to the floor of his cell. The warders sat him up, but they could make nothing of him. He was dazed, and he could not speak. He was taken to the hospital wing. "'This man has had a stroke. He has gone dumb,' said the doctor. On the following day he appeared to be well enough, but still he could not speak. He went about the ward doing hospital duty, dumb as a ladder. He could not even mourn, but a jig kept flickering through his voiceless mind. In a park there was a lake, on the lake there was a boat, in the boat there was a boy. Hour after hour the stupid jingle flowed through his consciousness. Perhaps it kept him from going mad, but it did not bring him back his speech. He was dumb, dumb and he remembered a man who had been stricken deaf and then blind. Scroop knew him, too. It was some man who had mocked God. In a park there was a lake, on the lake there was a boat, in the boat there was a boy. On the day of the funeral, Pavey imagined that he had been let out of prison. He dreamed that someone had been kind and set him free for an hour or two to bury his dead boy. He seemed to arrive at Thasper when the ceremony was already begun. The coffin was already in the church. Pavey knelt down beside his mother. The rector intoned the office. The child was taken to its grave. Dumb, dreaming Pavey turned his eyes from it. The day was too bright for death. It was a stainless day. The wind seemed to flow in soft streams rolling the lilac blooms. A small white feather, blown from a pigeon on the church gable, whirled about like a butterfly. We give thee hearty thanks, the priest was saying, for that it hath pleased thee to deliver this our brother out of the miseries of this sinful world. At the end of it all, Pavey kissed his mother, and saw himself turn back to his prison. He went by the field paths away to the railway junction. The country had begun to look a little parched, for rain was wanted. Vividly he could see all this. But things were growing, corn was thriving greenly, the bean fields smelled sweet. A frill of yellow kilk and wild white carrot spray lined every hedge. Cattle dreamed in the grass, the colt stretched itself unregarded in front of its mother. Larks, wrens, yellow hammers. There were the great beech trees and the great hills, calm and confident, overlooking Cobbs and Peter, Thasper and Trinkle, Buzzleberry and Nuncton. He sees the summer is coming on. He is going back to prison. Courage is vain, he thinks. We are like the grass underfoot. A blade that excels is quickly shorn. In this sort of a world, the poor have no call to be proud. They had only need be penitent. In the park there was a lake, on the lake boat, in the boat. End of section 20. Recording by Kevin Brown. Section 21 of The Black Dog and Other Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Black Dog and Other Stories by A. E. Coppard.
Luxury. Eight o'clock of a fine spring morning in the hamlet of Kessel Pretty Peter, great horses with chains clinking down the road, and Alexander Finkel rising from his bed singing, Oh la so do, so la mi do, timing his notes to the ching of his neighbor's anvil. He boils a cup full of water on an oil stove. His shaving brush stands where it always stands upon the window ledge. So la so do, so do so la. But as he addresses himself to his toilet, the clamor of the anvil ceases, and then Finkel too becomes silent, for the unresting cares of his life begin again to afflict him. This cottage is no good, he mumbles, and I'm no good. Literature is no good when you live too much on porridge. Your writing's no good, sir. You can't get any glow out of oatmeal. Why did you ever come here? It's a hopeless job and you know it. Stropping his razor petulantly as if the sole of that frustrating oatmeal lay there between the leather and the blade, he continues. But it isn't the cottage. It isn't me. It isn't the writing. It's the privation. I must give it up and get a job as a railway porter. And indeed, he was very impoverished. The living he derived from his writings was meager. The cottage had many imperfections. Both its rooms were gloomy, and to obviate the inconvenience arising from its defective roof, he always slept downstairs. Two years ago, he had been working for a wallpaper manufacturer in Bethnal Green. He was not poor then, not so very poor. He had the clothes he stood up in, they were good clothes, and fifty pounds in the bank besides. But although he had served the wallpaper man for fifteen years, that fifty pounds had not been derived from clerking. He had earned it by means of his hobby, a little knack of writing things for provincial newspapers. On his thirty-first birthday, Finkel argued, for he had a habit of conducting long and not unsatisfactory discussions between himself and a self that apparently wasn't him, that what he could do reasonably well in his scanty leisure could be multiplied exceedingly if he had time and opportunity lived in the country, somewhere where he could go into a garden to smell the roses or whatever was blooming, and draw deep draughts of happiness, think his profound thoughts and realize the goodness of God, and then sit and read right through some long and difficult book about Napoleon or Mohammed. Bursting with literary ambition, Finkel had hesitated no longer. He could live on nothing in the country, for a time. He had the fifty pounds. He had saved it. It had taken him seven years, but he had made it and saved it. He handed in his notice. That was very astonishing to his master, who esteemed him, but more astonishing to Finkel was the parting gift of ten pounds which the master had given him. The workmen, too, had collected more money for him and bought for him a clock, a monster. It weighed twelve pounds and had a brass figure of Lohengrin on the top, while the serene old messenger man who cleaned the windows and bought serepitous beer for the clerks, gave him a prescription for the instantaneous relief of a painful stomach ailment. It might come in handy, he had said. That was two years ago, and now just think. He had bought himself an ink pot of crystalline glass, a large one, it held nearly half a pint, and two pens, one for red ink and one for black, besides a quill for signing his name with. Here he was at Pretty Peter, and the devil himself was in it. Nothing had ever been right. The hamlet itself was poor. Like all places near the chalk hills, its roads were of flint, the church was of flint, the farms and cots of flint with brick corners. There was an old milestone outside his cot. He was pleased with that. It gave the miles to London and the miles to Winchester. It was nice to have a milestone there like that. Your very own. He finished shaving and threw open the cottage door, the scent of wallflowers and lilac came to him as sweet almost as a wedge of newly cut cake. The may bloom on his hedge drooped over the branches like crudded cream, and the dew in the gritty road smelled of harsh dust in a way that was pleasant. Well, if the cottage wasn't much good, the bit of garden was all right. There was a rose bush, too, a little vagrant in its growth. He leaned over his garden gate. There was no one in sight. He took out the fire shovel and scooped up a clod of manure that lay in the road adjacent to his cottage and trotted back to place it in a little heap at the root of those scattered brain roses, pink and bulging, 
that never seemed to do very well, and yet were so satisfactory. Nice day, remarked Finkel, lolling against his doorpost. But it's always nice if you are doing a good day's work. A garden is all right, and literature is all right, and life's all right. Only I live too much on porridge. It isn't the privation itself, it's the things privation makes a man do. It makes a man do things he ought not want to do. It makes him mean. It makes him feel mean, I tell you. And if he feels mean and thinks mean, he writes meanly. That's how it is. He had written topical notes and articles, stories of gay life, of which he knew nothing, of sport, of which he knew less, a poem about hope, and some cheerful pieces for a girl's weekly paper. And yet his outgoings still exceeded his income, painfully and perversely after two years. It was terrifying. He wanted success. He had come to conquer, not to find what he had found. But he would be content with encouragement now, even if he did not win success. It was absolutely necessary. He had not sold a thing for six months. His public would forget him. His connection would be gone. There's no use, though, mused Finkel, as he scrutinized his worn boots, in looking at things in detail. That's mean. A large view is the thing. Whatever is isolated is bound to look alarming. But he continued to lean against the doorpost in the full blaze of the stark, almost gritty sunlight, thinking mournfully until he heard the porridge in the saucepan began to bubble. Turning into the room, he felt giddy, and scarlet spots and other phantasmagoria waved in the air before him. Without an appetite, he swallowed the porridge and ate some bread and cheese and watercress. Watercress, at least, was plentiful there, for the little runnels that came down from the big hills expanded in the pretty peter fields, and in their shallow bottoms the cress flourished. He finished his breakfast, cleared the things away, and sat down to see if he could write. But it was in vain. He could not write. He could think, but his mind would embrace no subject. It just teetered about with the objects within sight, the empty, disconsolate grate, the pattern of the rug and the black butterfly that hung dead upon the wall for so many months. Then he thought of the books he intended to read but could never procure, the books he had procured but did not like, the books he had liked but was already so soon forgetting. Smoking would have helped, and he wanted to smoke, but he could not afford it now. If ever he had a real good windfall, he intended to buy a tub, a little tub it would have to be, of course, and he would fill it to the bung with cigarettes, full to the bung, if it cost him pounds, and he would help himself to one whenever he had a mind to do so. Bah, you fool, he murmured. You think you have the whole world against you, that you are fighting it, keeping up your end with heroism. Idiot. What does it all amount to? You've withdrawn yourself from the world, run away from it, and here you sit making futile dabs at it like a child sticking pins into a pudding and wondering why nothing happens. What could happen? What? The world doesn't know about you, or care. You are useless. It isn't aware of you any more than a chain of mountains is aware of a gnat. And whose fault is that? Is it the mountain's fault? Idiot. But I can't starve, and I must go and get a job as a railway porter. It's all I'm fit for. Two farmers paused outside Finkel's garden and began a solid conversation upon a topic that made him feel hungry indeed. He listened, fascinated, though he was scarcely aware of it. Six stone lambs, said one, are fetching three pounds apiece. Ah, I shall fat some. Myself, I don't care for lamb, never did care. It's good eating. Ah, but I don't care for it. Now, we had a bit of spare rib last night off an old pig. Twas cold, you know, but beautiful. I said to my dame, What can mortal man want better than spare rib off an old pig? Tender and white, ate like lard. Yeah, it's good eating. Nor veal, I don't like. Nothing that's young. Veal's good eating. Don't care for it. Never did. It eats short to my mind. Then the school bell began to ring so loudly that Finkel could hear no more, 
but his mind continued to hover over the choice of lamb or veal or old pork until he was angry. Why had he done this foolish thing? Thrown away his comfortable job, reasonable food, ease of mind, friendship, pocket money, tobacco. Even his girl had forgotten him. Why had he done this impudent thing? It was insanity, surely. But he knew that man has instinctive reasons that transcend logic, what a parson would call the superior reason of the heart. I wanted a change and I got it. Now I want another change. But what shall I get? Chance and change, they are the sweet features of existence. Chance and change and not too much prosperity. If I were an idealist, I could live from my hair upwards. The two farmers separated. Finkel, staring haplessly from his window, saw them go. Some schoolboys were playing a game of marbles in the road there. Another boy sat on the green bank, quietly singing, while one in spectacles knelt slyly behind him, trying to burn a hole in the singer's breeches with a magnifying glass. Finkel's thoughts still hovered over the flavors and satisfactions of veal and lamb and pig until, like Mother Hubbard, he turned and opened his larder. There, to his surprise, he saw four bananas lying on a saucer. Bought from a traveling hawker a couple of days ago, they had cost him three pence half penny, and he had forgotten them. He could not afford another luxury like that for a week at least, and he stood looking at them full of doubt. He debated whether he should take one now. He would still have one left for Wednesday, one for Thursday, and one for Friday. But he thought he would not, he had had his breakfast, and he had not remembered them. He grew suddenly and absurdly angry again. That was the worst of poverty, not what it made you endure, but what it made you want to endure. Why shouldn't he eat a banana? Why shouldn't he eat all of them? And yet, bananas always seemed to him such luxuriant, expensive things, so much peel, and then two, or not more than three, delicious bites. But if he fancied a banana, there it was. No, he did not want to destroy the blasted thing. No reason at all why he should not. But that was what continuous hardship did for you. Nothing could stop this miserable feeling for economy now. If he had a thousand pounds at this moment, he knew he would be very careful about bananas and about butter and about sugar and things like that. But he would never have a thousand pounds. Nobody had ever had it. It was impossible to believe that anyone had ever had wholly and entirely to themselves a thousand pounds. It could not be believed. He was like a man dreaming that he had the hangman's noose around his neck. Yet the drop did not take place. It did not take place and it would not take place. But the noose was still there. He picked up the bananas one by one, the four bananas, the whole four, no other man in the world surely had ever had four such fine bananas as that and not wanted to eat them. Oh, why had such stupid, mean scruples seized him again? It was disgusting and ungenerous to himself. It made him feel mean. It was mean. Rushing to his cottage door, he cried, Here you are, to the playing schoolboys, and flung two of the bananas into the midst of them. Then he flung another. He hesitated at the fourth, and tearing the peel from it, he crammed the fruit into his own mouth, wolfing it down and gasping, So perish all such traitors. When he had completely absorbed its savor, he stared like a fool at the empty saucer. It was empty. The bananas were gone. All four irrecoverably gone. Damned pig, cried Finkel. But then he sat down and wrote all this, just as it appears. End of 21 End of The Black Dog and Other Stories by A. E. Coppard